So again, we're going to be talking about organizing our nutrition today. And um, I do just want to tell you that as we move on throughout this lecture or lecture, this, this series, that um, my references for everything that I'm talking about are on the slides themselves. Um, and again, feel free to interrupt me with questions as we progress. Let me also go ahead and turn myself. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and the layout of this conversation that we're having today is going to be talking about organization from the context of our physical organization, time organization, and our mental organization. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Kelsey Baez and I am the Wellcats Nutrition GA here at Texas State for Wellcats, obviously. Um, this person over here on the right is Lindsay Mangi. She is um, a Wellcats leadership team member and she is my boss. <laughs> um, an overall wonderful person. If you ever get to interact with her, she is phenomenal. Um, some things that I do here as a Wellcats Nutrition uh, GA is that I do one-on-one -on -one nutrition uh, counseling to help people um, move towards their nutritional goals that they have. Um, I also um, more or less bi-weekly host uh, proactive nutrition cooking classes where um, they're virtual right now, but uh, you just get to interact and work with me while we make a fun, exciting dish together. Uh, I also write blogs and we do seminars like what, uh, what you're seeing now. A little, about, a little bit about me on the personal level is that I'm a Texas State alum here from Texas, well, I'm a Texas State alum from the undergraduate program uh, of the human nutrition uh, uh, is, is my major. And I'm a non-traditional student in pretty much every, every stance of the word. I am a mother, I am a Navy wife, I had a 15 year career before I ever came to Texas State. The list goes on. Um, I also have a platform called Intrinsically Nourished um, on Facebook and Instagram, where I basically promote um, healthful nutrition eating and body positivity. And this all aligns with my future goal of becoming a future dietitian, hopefully in just a couple years here. <laughs> I'm almost there. Um, so we're going to dive into our uh, dive into our lecture, and the first thing we're talking about again is going to be our physical organization. Um, we're uh, talking about this in the context of being able to minimize like uh, bacteria and pathogen growth in our in our foods. So um, up until very recently, um, I did not know that there is a right way to organize your refrigerator. Um, whenever we're thinking about our refrigerators within our homes, for the most part, the cold source um, for uh, where it's going to be most cold in a refrigerator is going to be in the bottom back of the refrigerator in this area. So that um, is going to sort of dictate how we organize our, um, organize our refrigerator. So because the cold source is right back here, our doors are going to are, are going to be a little bit more warmer, which is why our condiments and like acidic drinks like juices are usually stored on the doors. Um, whenever we start from a top to bottom uh, look for our for our refrigerator, we want to have our ready to eat foods at the top of the refrigerator. And that is um, partially because if it's on the top, there's less likely going to be contamination that is going to be able to fall on top of our food. Um, and additionally, it's also going to be eye level. So things that we're ready to eat and that we um, are putting that, that we're wanting to consume more frequently, we should have more or less at eye level because we're more inclined to eat it. Um, I always like to just throw in this little tip here too, is that herbs like cilantro or like parsley, we can actually take it and put it into um, a cup or I use a mason jar with a little bit of water. And then you can put a bag like a Ziploc bag or even the, con or the bag container that a herb comes in and um, you put it over the cup with the herb in it so that it creates somewhat of an umbrella and it'll actually preserve your herbs for a little bit longer. Um, I can have it last, have cilantro last in my um, refrigerator for like upwards of two weeks by doing it this way as opposed to maybe just a couple of days in a drawer. So I always like to throw that little tip in there. Um, and again, we're putting it on the top because we don't, because it's going to go directly into our food and we don't want things to um, fall on top of it and contaminate it since we're not more than likely not going to be heating up the food. Um, 
So that's the top, the middle here, they're showing cooked meats and leftovers. Predominantly what this is, is we're wanting it to be nutrient dense foods. Again, things that we're wanting to eat and consume more of. And um, we're wanting to uh, mainly have things that we're gonna reheat. So uh, like your leftovers, or even maybe even like pre-cooked like vegetables that we're gonna be cooking throughout the, throughout the week. And that is um, one, because of that cold source again, uh, the cold source within the refrigerator refrigerator and also um, based on uh, we don't want things like uh, leaky meats that we want on the bottom of the refrigerator to be above things that we're may maybe only reheating. Um, so that seg segues us into the bottom. This, uh, this image does depict milk in the bottom back and again that's because of the cold. Um, sometimes I have mine hanging out over here. Sometimes it goes on the door, <laughs> you know, it, but I mean there's not a perfect uh, perfect place, but you just want to keep it bottom, I would say, because of that cold. Um, and whenever we're, we're, we're looking at raw meats in particular, we're wanting to make sure that not only are they um, sealed, right, um, to prevent contamination, but even if they're sealed, we want to put like a bowl or a plate underneath them because those packaging, that packaging isn't perfect and they can still leak. And if we have those juices leaking onto our refrigerator, that's going to promote bacteria growth within our refrigerator, even after we remove the meat. And it could also leak leach down into the um, fruits and vegetable drawer that we have. And we certainly don't want that. Excuse me. So um, our fruits and our vegetables, we primarily want to keep in two separate, um, in the two separate drawers, vegetables in one and fruits in the other. And a lot of that is because the, uh, the vegetables emit different compounds that can actually degrade your soft fruits faster. So if you have like strawberries, for instance, they're, um, they're not going to go very well being stored right next to, um, right next to a vegetable. So um, something else that I would like to add is that I had mentioned well, at the beginning of this PowerPoint that um, we want to have foods that are ready to eat at the top. But if we are wanting to eat more fruits and vegetables and we put them in a drawer below eye level where we can't see them, it makes it more difficult for us to eat them. So an approach that I do is that I actually keep the bulk of my fruits and my vegetables inside of these drawers, but I actually will pre-rinse small batches. Like for instance, I have strawberries right now. Um, I wash my strawberries. I put a paper towel um, in the bottom of a bowl and then I put my dry strawberries uh, or my freshly rinsed strawberries on top of that. And then I cover it with a, with a container and then I put it eye level so I can see it and I, I can just grab it whenever I'm feeling like some strawberries and it's ready to go. So that's um, another way to be able to just facilitate your um, nutritional goals. Uh, whenever we look at a pantry, again, eye level is going to be important. We want our nutrient dense foods and more frequently used foods um, eye level for us. I do just want to caveat um, eye level if we have little ones running around, like uh, if we're parents. Um, eye level is two different locations for the child. So my two-year-old, this is her eye level. And all of these clear things down here are her eye level because she can see through the bottom of everything. So just keep that in mind if you have multiple um, sets of eyes looking inside of your uh, pantry. So um, again, we're doing eye level for those nutrient dense foods and foods that we want to eat more of. And then we're moving foods that are more energy dense, like snacks and treats. Um, we're going to move them more out of eye level. We could put them down here or even up here. Um, and those we would like to put inside of a basket because a basket or like a dark container, like what we see over here, because it's just not making that eye contact with you. So you're less inclined to mindlessly eat them. It's more, you are making more of a choice whenever you go in and you grab those things. Um, containers, and this actually goes for a refrigerator and pantry. We want to have lids and labels on all of our, uh, on all of our, um, on all of our packages and all of the things that we put in because that's going to help us be aware of how long it's been there and how long it's been open. 
Um, the I love this picture a lot, but um, one thing that I do have to critique is it down here at the bottom, they have some food stored on the floor. Now it's great that they put these in um, in the baskets because it does create a little bit of a barrier, but we want to try and have our food stored six inches off of the ground, and that's because it's going to promote or discourage actually is going to ex discourage um, pests being able to access your food because if you start getting pests here chances are you're going to end up getting pests here so just things to consider something else that we should talk about is temperature and shelf life so um, this over here is what we call the temperature danger zone and it's basically any um, foods that we would typically eat warm or cold. We don't want them to fall in between this 41 to 135 degrees for more than four hours. If a food reaches, um, like for instance, if you're thawing a meat on a, on, on a countertop all day, or if you make, um, you make, you make a casserole, casserole or something and you leave it on, on a counter to cool. We don't want it to cool for longer than four hours because that's going to put it in the danger zone. And that danger zone is basically gonna promote bacteria and pathogen growth. Um, when it comes to like pantry items, we're a little less worried about temperature because the temperature is going to, um, or the products are made for that, for our ambient um, temperature that we naturally keep our houses in. But because of this danger zone, our refrigerator is some, is a reason, our refrigerator should be at um, 40 degrees or less to be able to uh, discourage that bacteria and pathogen growth. Um, our freezers should be at zero or below. And I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but basically here are some key things um, whenever it comes to shelf life. I am gonna highlight here meats um, that it's two to five days. That is um, in the refrigerator, whether it is uh, raw or cooked, I would say. Um, you're, you're looking at two if it's like a, if it's like a fish or, um, or a, a meal that's already cooked or already cooked meat. And then your five days would be like with it being raw and with it being cooked. The, the three months to a year, this is um, regarding freezing. So three months, if it's a cooked meat, it can stay in, in a, an air, airtight container um, in your freezer. And then it can uh, go up to a year if it's raw. Um, lunch meats three to five days. That is if it's opened. If it's unopened, of course, you can follow the expiration date. But if you get like deli meats or something where you don't get an expiration date, um, maximum is usually uh, two weeks. Soups and stews. This is regardless of if there is meat in there or not. Uh, general rule of leftovers are there. Um, oh, and the potatoes, I wanted to tell you. Potatoes, three to five weeks, that is in a dark location. If you don't, I keep mine in my pantry, but if you don't have a location like that, then consider putting them in a paper bag and then writing on that paper bag, bag very largely potatoes so you don't forget about them. Um, so those are kind of the essentials um, for physically organizing. Now we're gonna move into organizing our time. So we want to make time for our nourishment because it is really like a um, catapult for our health. And uh, I, it's important to have barriers around that. So uh, considering that we, I am talking to uh, uh, all the Wellcats family, I want to make sure that we are talking about this in the context of work as well. So whenever we're looking at the gr daily grind, like whenever just throughout life and the, even within within our um, work schedule, it's important that we're creating time and space for us to be able to eat. We need to honor and establish boundaries around all of our meal times. So that means like if you have a lunch, take your lunch. Um, parents, first thing in the morning when you're getting your kids ready and you feed your, your child breakfast, don't forget to feed yourself. These are important barriers that it is to be able to help propel us throughout the day and have efficient energy levels. Um, and it also is just setting that barrier and that boundary, which are um, he healthy to have. Um, now, 
we I do uh, like that whenever we are eat whenever we uh, have that barrier around our food or our boundary around the time of our food that another thing that we could do to just re reinforce it is to have a lunch a buddy because that reinforces accountability if you have a lunch buddy you're more than likely going to stop what you're doing and then go and enjoy lunch and then come back to, come back to work um, once you're done with that. Um, whether you have a lunch buddy or not, I do recommend you changing your environment whenever you eat. So if you're working at a desk, get up and go to whether it's a table in the middle of the office, it's a communal space, or, um, or even at Texas State, we have benches everywhere. You could have like a picnic outside. Uh, now, when talking about snacks, I'm a big proponent of snacks. Um, if we're looking at like an eight to five typical job, snack check-in time should be probably around like 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., uh, assuming that you've had breakfast, lunch, and then you're planning on having dinner at like or around, around that eight to five schedule. Um, and what I, what I like to call them is snack is check ins rather than snack times, because it's just a time for you to be able to assess whether or not you are hungry at that time, but to align yourself with whatever health goals you may have, I recommend you having a plan. And part of that is having a snack drawer or even an office refrigerator to where you can house, house snacks that are, uh, that facilitate those goals that you have. Um, if you have these snack drawers and you have these refrigerators, you're increasing your accessibility, which makes you more likely to eat the food. And um, just a side note, I would like to say that with snacks in general, if you're working and doing a task and you realize that you're hungry, I recommend that you eat and then do your task rather than do your task and then eat. And the reason why I say that is because if we take our moment to be able to eat our food and we acknowledge that and then we move on, one, we're going to be more energized for our task. But two, if we do the reverse and wait too long, we're more likely going to eat more than we would have if we would have just stopped in that moment and honored our honored our hunger. Um, snacks in general should have a protein, a fat and a carbohydrate. And um, this often surprises people, but I would like to say that like oh, your protein and your fat often can be combined, especially whenever it's in a, in a snack setting. So for instance, like we could have apple with peanut butter. Apple is gonna be that carbohydrate for you and you're getting a little bit of fiber there, which is gonna help you feel fuller for longer. But then that peanut butter is a protein and a fat both for you. So, you're, it's, so that snack is gonna be able to carry you on until lunch or till dinner, whenever your next meal time is. Um, some other examples could be like hummus with crackers and vegetable sticks, or even like trail mix. I love just a big handful of trail mix because you're getting that dehydrated fruit and the, those nuts, or you're getting that protein and that fat in there as well. Um, whenever I talk about snacks, uh, uh, something that I often hear is that um, people are surprised that it sounds like it's a lot of food. And um, I generally say, yes, <laughs> that's the purpose of a snack. <laughs> um, so if we look at it in the point, uh, in the context of like someone eating a 2000 calorie diet, which is relatively average for um, a, a recommendation, like a general recommendation. Um, if you have three meals a day with the two snacks, your two snacks are gonna be about 200 to 300 calories per, per snack. And I tell you all this just because I know that there's a lot of hundred calorie snacks out there. And if that fills you up, great. But if you end up deciding that you want two of your hundred calorie snacks, that's okay too. Don't let packaging determine your hunger or lack thereof. Um, moving on, we're gonna talk about meal planning. Now meal planning, I uh, like to try and tell everyone, I'm, I'm actually going to jump down here and just tell everyone to be realistic whenever we're looking at our meal planning. Some people really enjoy having like a, a full, um, enjoy like planning for an entire month or a week. And, uh, and that's fine if that's something that you want to do, but just meet it to whatever you, whatever you uh, need. 
So um, some, some of my clients really enjoy planning out every single meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they know that they're going to have this protein for lunch and that it's going to be baked and that this vegetable is going to be in the air fryer and so on and so forth. Um, but then there's other ways that we can that we can do meal planning, which is um, by getting inspired and having theme days. This is actually an approach that I do. So I'll have like meatless Mondays and on meatless Mondays, typically I'm having tofu or seafood. And I have like four or five different staples of um, go to meals that I have for meatless Monday. Sometimes I don't want any of, the, of my staple meals and I go find a recipe, but it meets that theme. So it makes it easier for me to find something and then create and then create a meal plan based off of these themes. Um, I would also like to say that convenience is okay. So for instance, um, I primarily only plan my dinners and then I have bulk ideas more or less for what lunch is gonna be. And almost all of my lunches are gonna involve an instant rice just because I don't have the time during the day to really be able to make my own fresh pot of rice. So 90 seconds in a microwave is more realistic for me to be able to have that and um, mash up some tuna and throw a bag salad together so that I have a complete meal, but it was ready in like five minutes. And that's still a form of meal planning and that absolutely counts. And um, canned, canned and frozen are another great way to have convenience foods that are there on hand that are going to be able to make your meal planning be easier. Um, if there's one really big takeaway that I could tell you from this slide, it is to save your meal plans. <laughs> um, it took me a really long time to realize that I'm putting a ton of work into thinking up what I'm going to eat. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so on and so forth. So saving those meal plans that I've already spent that time uh, to be able to, um, to have those saved on weeks that maybe I don't have as much time really facilitates my ability to stay with the health goals that I have and um, not just like be scrambling every day for every day for dinner. So um, moving on past that, we've got our meal prep and um, bulk cooking. So again, your bulk cooking, it can be as frequently as you want to do it. One month, once a week, it could even be per meal. And by per meal, I mean like, let's say you're making a lasagna. A lasagna, depending on how you do it, could be a really labor labor intensive process. So if you make two lasagnas and you throw one in the oven, one, one in the oven to cook for, for that meal, and then you put another one in the freezer for you to have in a couple of weeks or a month or so, that is a form of bulk cooking. It doesn't necessarily have to be cooking, you know, for an entire month and having it, fro having it frozen. Um, another way to bulk cook is by like, cooking and then um, swapping meals with someone else. So maybe you double what you're cooking and then you, sw you swap with a neighbor or you even swap a recipe. Um, and then that is another way to be able to have more food, but have it uh, a change up experience so that it's um, not monotonous. Um, and then of course we can always freeze for later or you could even um, freeze whether it is cooked or raw. Um, meal prepping can also look like bulk chopping or washing. I already talked to you about the fruits and the vegetables earlier with the refrigerator, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there. But um, whenever it comes to bulk chopping, it is a time consuming uh, process to be able to chop. And if we move it to a time in our week where we have a little bit more time frame, that can save easily anywhere from time five to 20 minutes, depending on the meal um, during your weekday cooking. Um, dense starches like potatoes or carrots or, um, or like uh, yucca even, you can peel and dice up and put in a bowl of water. And that'll stay in your refrigerator for about five days without it deteriorating or like potatoes turning brown. Uh, so just something to be aware that there are ways to um, have that bulk chopping last for us. And then um, next we're moving on to parboiling. Parboiling can be um, parboiling meat. So then maybe if you're boiling meat, it could turn into like a shredded meat that you have. And then um, you're 
you're putting that in smaller batches after it's cooked without air and then you're freezing them so that you have quick meals to pull out for like shredded enchiladas or something to put on top of like a tostada. Um, noodles, you can parboil noodles. So let's say that an, an average spaghetti noodle that you cook takes 20 minutes to cook. If you're going to meal prep some extra noodles, you could um, cook it for like 15 minutes instead of 20. And then some, and then you would drain that water out of it. You would submerge it into an ice cold water bath. And then you could portion out your noodles in an airtight container. And then whenever it's time to cook it, the next time around you boil some water and just drop those noodles in there and they're ready in like five minutes. Um, so those are ways that we can use parboiling for meal prep and um, meal planning. If you're going to bake things uh, that like, for instance, meat, we would cook it to where it reaches the minimal temperature that it's supposed to have. So like 165 degrees for a chicken, but then we would immediately remove it from the, from the, uh, from the oven container and let it cool rapidly. And then after it cools rapidly, we could then store it in our freezer so that whenever it comes time for us to be able to cook it later, um, throughout the month or whatever, then um, that is a quick ready to eat meal. It'll be ready in like 15 minutes. Um, or at least the meat. I think I saw a chat. Let me go. No, yes, chat. What do I mean freeze without air? Okay, so there are a variety of ways that we can freeze without air, but um, I, I will preface by saying that I have a food saver and with a food saver, I, um, it, it's a, you take it and it basically heats and sucks air out for you. But that can also mean like if you have a Ziploc bag, then um, something that I used to do before I had my food saver is that I would take like my soup or my casserole or whatever, um, or my meat. And then I would push all the, all the um, con contents to the bottom. And then I would basically roll the, the package so that it can, that it moved towards the um, seal line. And then that pushed out most of the air and then I would close it. And then once I closed it, I would unwrap it and put it in the, put it in the freezer. So air by airtight, I mean, just removing the air essentially. The only time that we don't want to remove a lot of air is whenever we're it, whenever it's something aqueous, something liquidy. So like our soups, um, we want to have just a little little thin, thin layer of air and that's just so that it has room to expand. Um, I also bulk bulk prepare sauces like pestos and marinaras and um, those I'll, I'll leave a little bit of room room. So I hope that answers the question. If not, drop it in the chat and I will try to elaborate more. We'll also have a Q&A session at the end of this um, as well. And then Teresa had her hand up. Oh, yeah, I just had a I quick question. See. Um, what did you mean by quick freezing? How, how do you do that? Quick freezing? So it can be a variety of different things. So um, mainly I would say if you can submerge it in an ice bath, that is best. Um, so like if it is your noodles, right, you would drain the water out of your noodles and then I would take those noodles and put it in an ice bath. And usually that for me, an ice bath is either a, a large uh, tub container that I have or a very well cleaned out sink. And then um, I'm just dropping them in there. If it's something like meat, I might put them into um, a heat resistant container because it's still going to be hot. And then I'm going to cover that up and then I'm going to put that in an ice bath as well. Those are ways to rapidly um, refrigerate it or rapidly cool it. But we don't want to take something that's fresh and hot and then put it into our refrigerator or into our freezer because whenever that's hot and then we're putting into a source that is cold, then we are... Um, then we're raising the temperature overall of that compartment. So then it compromises the other food within, within the compartment that you're putting it in. So you're either increasing the temperature of the refrigerator or the freezer and allow in creating an environment where bacteria and pathogens can grow. Does that help? Yes, thanks. Okay, great. Um, so then I'm gonna move on to organizing our thoughts uh, unless there are any other questions. 
So I want us to take a moment to um, just think about what does healthy food look like? I want you to know that this is a judgment-free zone. And I want you to know that as we move forward, everything that I am going to um, line out here, I guess you could say, are general recommendations and that if you have specific health concerns, um, I do, or, or medical conditions or a specific diet that you have to be on related to those conditions, you should talk to your doctor or registered dietitian before, um, before making any changes. But um, moving forward, this is just general, general nutrition um, knowledge. So the first thing that I would like to um, put on your radar is mindful eating. So mindful eating is becoming aware of a habit, a body signal or attitude that we have towards foods without any judgments. So the um, basic approaches for having mindful eating is to listen to our body cues. And listening to our body cues means before, during, and after eating. Um, it is acknowledging whether we are hungry or we are not hungry and whether we are satisfied with what we ate or if we're not satisfied with what we ate. It's important that we take our time whenever we're eating to be able to listen to those body cues and just to be able to focus in on what it is that we are that we are um, that we are that we are doing. We want to be present in what we are in in our food and in, in all things. Uh, we want to become aware of mindless eating. So mindless eating could be um, acknowledging a habit that you may have. So if it's like emotional eating, for instance, or if um, uh, it could be like if you have a candy jar that's right next to your right next to your uh, to your computer desk, right? So then um, that candy jar is there. So you're just eating candy and not even thinking about it. So actively moving it so that you have to make the conscious decision to go get your candy. It's part of becoming aware of your mindless eating. Um, we want to remove distractions from our eating again, so that we can take our time li and listen to our body cues. Distractions could be um, electronics. It could be being in very large group settings. Um, there, there's a variety of things that can go there and it's just um, part of you being aware of what is a distraction for yourself. And then next would be removing judgments. Um, it's definitely not la the, the least important, I would say. Judgments are, um, are, fr are frequently associated with different foods. So with that being said, a lot of uh, terminology out there within our society is that there are good foods and there are bad foods. But I really invite you that it's time to kick that mentality because foods do not hold moral value. They do not tell us whether we are good or we are bad. Um, there are nutrient dense foods and there are energy dense foods. And what that means is that for nu nutrient dense foods, it means that there are more nutrients than calories per gram of food. And energy dense foods have more calories than nutrients per gram of food. We're wanting to eat more nutrient dense foods because they are going to help propel um, our energy levels and stuff. But energy dense foods can do the same thing. Well, they, they, they still provide us with energy so that we can still um, do different movements um, and they both can be part of a healthful diet. Uh, so it's just a matter of how does, how does this balance look like for you? So moving on past that, I do want to show you myplate.gov. This is what replaced the food pyramid. So as you can see, half of the plates are fruits and vegetables. We've got grains, proteins, and dairy. Our um, fruits and vegetables are great sources for like fiber, vitamin C, folate, potassium, um, beta carotenes. And these are all things that help with like blood pressure, heart health, cholesterol, uh, bowel function, wound healing, healthy gums. Like I, they're, it, they're, they're, those, those vitamins and minerals are important is I guess what I'm really just trying to communicate there. Um, so whenever it comes to fruits, uh, for females over the age of nine, my plate suggests having 1.5 to two cups a day for fruits and males should be about two to 2.5 cups a day. 
Uh, and what is a cup? Well, a cup could be like a small apple the size of your fist. It could be a large banana. It could be a large orange. It could be about eight strawberries. Um, but it's also like half a cup of dried fruit. That would be equivalent to one cup. Um, fruit juice, 100% fruit juice. Uh, one, it's a one cup to one cup ratio there as well. For our vegetables, um, females over the age of 14, it's recommended two to three cups a day. Males over the age of 14, it's recommend, excuse me, recommended three to four cups of vegetables a day. So a cup of like a raw leafy green, it would if it's cooked is one cup. If it's raw, it's actually two cups that counts counts for one cup uh, of a, of a serving. Um, but then we've also got like our carrots and cooked pumpkin that could be diced and bell peppers and tomatoes. Uh, let's not forget about those two. Uh, grains, we want to aim for half of our grains to be whole grains. Note that I didn't say all of them. I mean, of course, if you want to do all of them, but I just also have run across to where people are like, I'm not going to eat. I'm not moving from my white rice. I love white rice. And that's completely okay. We can still eat white rice and have a and, and introduce whole grains in other areas. So just figure out how that would look like for you. Um, but we want, part of the reason why we want those whole grains is because they're gonna be rich in like fiber, B vitamins, um, minerals like iron, magnesium, and selenium, which are good for our, excuse me, our cholesterol, our uh, microbiota, which is the gut bacteria that we have, um, immune system function. There's a lot of great things there. Um, so it is recommended that uh, females over the age of 14 have three to four ounce equivalents of, uh, of grains and that males over the age of 14 have three to five ounce equivalents. And an equivalent could be like a slice of bread. So if you have four, if, you, if you're aiming for four equivalents a day and you have a sandwich, that's two equivalents. So then you have two more equivalents throughout that day. So then other equivalents could be like half a cup of oatmeal, rice, or cooked pasta. Um, it could also be like a small six inch tortilla, which is roughly about the width of your hand there. Um, or like a corn tortilla, like the standard corn tortilla is usually great. Um, proteins uh, are great for muscle building and also help with immune function as well. They're uh, the recommendation for male and females over the age of 14 is five to six ounces. Um, now, of course, ounces, if you're talking about meat, is going to be a one ounce to one ounce equivalent there. But then there's also things like tofu that are low in saturated fats, which is something we want to aim for throughout our diet. Um, so tofu, a quarter cup of that or a quarter cup of beans or legumes like lentils are um, great protein sources as well. Um, a tablespoon of a nut butter, like peanut butter or almond butter, is, a, is an equivalent. Also eggs, let's not forget our eggs, they're wonderful. And then um, we have dairy over here on the side. So dairy is often thought of as calcium, right? So, and of course there, there is calcium there, but there are other things too. So our, calci our, our milks are usually fortified with like vitamin A and D. It'll have riboflavin, it has B12, proteins, potassium, zinc, chlorine, magnesium, selenium, like there's so many things. But um, whenever we're looking at it from a calcium standpoint, yes, the, we're talking about bone health, osteoporo osteoporosis prevention, we're building up bone mass for our children um, that are consuming it. And the recommendation there is about three cups a day of dairy for males or females over the age of nine. And a cup, of course, is a cup of milk, but it's also like a cup of yogurt. Hard cheeses, a quarter ounce is equivalent to, is an equivalent of one serving. Three ounces of shredded cheese as one. Um, your froyo, that is still going to be one cup. Ice cream is one and a half cups. And I do understand that dairy is one of the top allergens, so not everyone can have it because of lactose, but be aware that there are lactose-free options that we can purchase that are still milks. Um, my family, we often buy a Mootopia from HEB and it's delicious, we like it. 
Um, but then there are other reasons that people may not want to consume dairy. So um, the next recommendation, if you're not going to have uh, dairy from, well, dairy from, so from a cow would be to have soy milk. Um, soy milk is going to be more equivalent um, as on pro proteins and usually less, um, less, less of different sugars um, compared to some of the other plant-based uh, milk uh, di dairy sources that, we, that there are. Um, additional calcium is usually fortified into soy, which is another reason why it's recommended. And then other calcium sources are like um, tofu, uh, tahini, canned fish that still have the bones in it, so like sardines. And then of course, you can always look for calcium fortified foods if you do not um, consume dairy. Um, when we look at dietary patterns, there are tons of dietary patterns out there. These are what I feel to be the most common. Um, omnivore, meaning that you that this per, this this dietary pattern eats uh, both animals and plants, and that can include like the the different varieties within it. So, poultry, fish, and then all the different um, plants that we have. Vegetarian, there are a lot of subcategories of, of vegetarian. So um, vegetarians may still eat dairy or they will have, um, they'll have eggs or there's, um, I, I know veganism is really popular where it's basically, if it came from an animal, it's not okay, period for, for that diet. And that it, or, or that they feel is not, is not okay. Um, so that's including honey. Uh, pescatarian is kind of like uh, the in between of these two, so it's usually very rich in in, in uh, fruits and vegetables and whole grains, but it's also um, getting in about ten ounces a week of fish, and that fish is going to really provide some omega threes, vitamin D, and B twelve. Um, B twelve for the most part um, only comes from animal sources, so um, having Having the uh, having fish or having meat is going to allow you to have a more B B12 rich diet. Um, the omnivore diet uh, uh, dietary pattern is going to have uh, some benefits like uh, having iron that's more bioavailable that your body can use a little bit easier. And um, there is a perception that it is more flexible, but I would just stress that that is a perception. All of these can be flexible. Um, vegetarianism, there are great benefits there as well because um, we're cutting out a lot of the um, meat sources. We're reducing our saturated fat, which is great for heart health. There's a potential for a really high nutrient profile uh, because of the different uh, fruits, vegetables, and whole grains that you're eating. Um, just be aware of ultra pack packaged foods are going to to probably have a little less nutrients. And it's often a lower cost option because meat is a bigger ticket item. Um, the, but each one of these diets also have concerns. So if you're looking at like an omnivore diet, you're having higher saturated fat and it's typically associated with less fruits and vegetables. So just make sure that um, you're trying to meet those my plate needs um, within that omnivore diet. Vegetarianism, um, depending on which degree, which type of vegetarianism you are, concerns could be like your B12, vitamin D, omega 3s, calcium, iron, and zinc. Of course, there are ways and all of these diets to be able to meet our needs. It's just that you, you may need to um, be more conscious about them within each diet. And then um, for pescatarians, there is um, mercury levels, which is um, which can be toxic. So that's why it's recommended for about 10 ounces of fish per week. Um, so most of these diet patterns get pushed as like um, the perfect diet. And again, I just want to just tell you that my definition of a perfect diet is one in which you can maintain and consume the most nutrients to elevate your health without compromising your life quality. Um, so whatever that looks like for you, nutrition can meet you there. <laughs> and, um, if you're not sure what that looks like, reach out to me, um, we'll actually reach out to Josh and he will be the one to put you in contact with me and we can explore that option for you. 
So I know this is a lot of information really fast. So the recap basically is that organizing our nutrition is complex. It's physical, it's mental and um, time bound. Well, that's not what's supposed to be there. Excuse me. It's physical, it's mental, and it is um, time. Yeah, time. It is time bound. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so what I like to do with all of my um, nutrition consults and what I'd like to do with you right now is based on everything that I just threw at you, <laughs> um, what stood out to you the most and what is something that you, that you feel that you could adapt within, these, within the next two weeks that um, you would like to incorporate into your, into your life to be able to move towards a more healthful goal? Um, we want to do what is called a smart goal. So with whatever it is that you are envisioning in your, in your mind, we already have it um, time bound to two weeks. But now I want you to think about specifically, where are we going to fit that? So if you want to, if you want to increase fruits and vegetables, then Let's talk about where are those fruits going to go? Are you going to have a snack at 10 a.m. and that snack is going to be and that snack is going to be fruit and it's going to be balanced? Um, just consider those different things and write that goal down for you. And then in two weeks, check in on you, with yourself and see how you accomplish that goal. And if you didn't accomplish it, it's fine. Just think of how or how's a way that I can reframe this or do, what's something that I can do instead that it is something that I can accomplish. Um, but creating life change is hard and creating habit change is really hard. So this is just a methodology in order of how to do that. Um, I provided some resources on um, just different things that we talked about throughout this um, throughout this like th throughout this series that I hope you would find helpful. And I now want to just open up the floor to any questions that you may have. And I do want to say thank you for your time. <laughs> hey, Kelsey, can you go back to that other screen <laughs> just real quickly? Which screen? The one right before this one. I had your links. This that one, one right there. That one right there. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. That's a good question. A good thing to have. Um, I know that Ellie also uh, sent out a link for the um, for the PowerPoint, but if you don't have it, I might be able to drop it in the chat here for you guys. Um, I'm going to include it in the um, follow up email that I'm about to send out. Oh, so perfect. I, I get, yeah, I could send them to everyone who didn't receive it. There we go. That way you can have it. Oh, I see a chat. Let's see. I'm just hearing that I'm hearing thank you. So you are welcome. I'm so happy that um, I'm so happy that I can help. I get really excited about this stuff. So I talk really fast and I'm sorry, I tried to slow down, <laughs> but if you need me to repeat anything, I am not, um, I, I won't be offended. <laughs> okay, well, if there aren't any questions, I just, again, wanna say thank you so much for your time. And um, we will, We'll, we'll end here shortly, but I'm going to stay on. But otherwise, thank you so much for being here and um, spending a little bit of your day with me. And I just dropped in the survey. So if y'all could please take a few minutes to share your feedback, um, we'd really appreciate it. Yes. And give me honest feedback. I am not, uh, I'm not soft hearted. I want to know how I can, um, how I can make this better for everybody. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hey, Kelsey, I had a question. Sure. So um, I've been trying to make vegan pancakes, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, that was my first thought. So <laughs> I looked up a recipe and, you know, they have all the ingredients, they have the step-by-step -step, and they have the video where they do all this stuff. Yeah. Every time I make it, 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 I guess the batter never thickens and mm -hmm. it just turns into like slop essentially. And it kind of just sticks to the pan. Yeah. 
so whenever I said, oh, that was because I was wondering what the binding agent would be to make it not be a slop. Yeah. Um, I, I would be more than interested to try it. I'm wondering if nutritional yeast could help you there because it's going to help it rise a little bit more. You might also try just having a hotter pan so that it just is going to cook everything faster and then it's going to create that little bit of crisp. But I think that it's still going to be um, relatively soft. Because um, I've seen, I've only tried the one recipe and I kind of looked for like, like a, a different one. So they had like uh, sweet potato for the pancakes, you know, the original yeah. one was just like, it just had uh, vanilla, apple cider vinegar, non-dairy milk, salt, baking powder, or flour and organic sugar. Yeah. So I'm <clears throat> wondering if you could substitute the milk for like a yogurt. Yogurt. Yeah, so the yogurt could be thicker. And then you might have to introduce a little bit of water, maybe like a tablespoon or two. But I'm wondering if that yogurt wouldn't give you that binding agent. I'm really curious. I'm going to research this and I will follow up with you. <laughs> there, there's a way to do it. I just don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I it just, it vexed me because usually if I don't get it the first time, I can usually kind of figure it out the second time around. And then it was just like the same thing happened both times. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking that it just, it needs something that's going to hold everything together. So that's, that's going to be that yogurt, um, possibly, or, or a real, if you do it like a sweet potato, like you had mentioned before, I would make sure that it's like a really dryly mashed sweet potato. Like maybe you bake the mat, the, the potato and you mash that instead of boiling okay. it in water. Um, so that's going to hold it together. And then I would just make sure that your pan's really hot before you put anything down. So it kind of sears it. Gotcha. Cool, cool.